Hello and welcome to all of you. Today I would like to start with a weird question. Do you think there is a common point between the conflicts in Rwanda, Uganda, Northern Ireland, the Balkans, and let's say the Cold War and even the Peloponnesian Wars? Anyone would be a fool to say yes. However, in all these instances, analysts have shown that there is always one crucial factor involved – distrust. Now, it would be great if we could have a theoretical model of trust. Luckily, there is one on the market that comes from game theory. It is called the prisoner's dilemma. All right, so what is the prisoner's dilemma? Well, let's imagine that a bank robbery was just committed. The police has arrested two suspects, two respectable gentlemen whose names are Capon and Escobar. Capon and Escobar really committed the robbery, but the police has no evidence against them. So they decide to interrogate them separately. Capon and Escobar have two options. They can either remain silent or they can choose to betray their accomplice. Now, here's the deal. If both of them remain silent, they will each serve one year in prison and no more for petty crimes. If both of them denounce their accomplice, they will each serve three years in prison. Now, if one of them chooses to betray and the other chooses to remain silent, the one who betrayed will be set free and the one who remains silent will serve five years in jail. What is very important is that both players have no option for retribution outside of a game. And besides, they cannot communicate with each other. Now, what do you think Capon on Escobar should do? What would you do? Well, globally speaking, it seems pretty obvious that the best solution is that they both remain silent. However, things are not that simple. Let's put ourselves in Escobar's shoes. If Capon betrays him, Escobar ought to betray him as well in order to serve three years in prison instead of five. Now, if Capon remains silent, Escobar ought to betray him again in order to be set free instead of serving one year in jail. So whatever is Capon's choice, Escobar's best option will always be to betray him. And the same conclusion, of course, applies to Capon. Individually speaking, each of them has a personal interest in betraying the other. Now look at what happens here. The two players will be naturally attracted to this configuration because none of them has a personal interest to move from it. It is what we call a Nash equilibrium. In this case, the Nash equilibrium is globally unfavorable. Now, there is a paradox. Each of them would do collectively better if they adopted an individually irrational strategy, which is to remain silent. The situation I just described, called the prisoner's dilemma, is one of the most famous games in game theory. It can be generalized with this payoff matrix where you consider rewards instead of years in prison. All right, now how can this apply to the real world of international relations? Let's take the example of the Cold War. The bipolar confrontation between the US and the USSR could be characterized as a form of prisoner's dilemma. Basically, both countries had the choice between developing arms or focusing on education, infrastructures, culture. Now, the globally best situation would be that both countries focus on education, infrastructures, culture. However, if only one country focuses on developing arms, this country will dominate the other. Therefore, the two countries will be naturally drawn to a Nash equilibrium where they focus on developing arms. This is the so-called arms race. Recently, scholars have applied this to the escalating situation between Pakistan and India 
or to the arms race between Greece and Turkey. Now, of course, the difficulty is that international relations include much more variables. And besides, there is a trick. In the situation that I just presented, you only get to play one time. And in a one-off game, betraying always gives the best payout. And for a simple reason, it bears no consequences. In real life, you get to play more than one time. And besides, you get to remember what the other player did. In other words, in real life, Capone would not get away with betraying Escobar that easily. And this is where things get really exciting, because you can test the evolution of cooperation by repeating the game. This is what game theorists call the iterated prisoner's dilemma, or the repeated prisoner's dilemma. Now, to play in a repeated game, what you need is a strategy. Basically, you need to decide how you want to play based on your previous moves and on your opponent's previous moves. Examples of strategies are you are always cooperative. This is a nice strategy. You always defect. This is a nasty strategy. You cooperate until the first defection and after that you defect until the end of the game. This is a gradual strategy. The random strategy would be well to randomly select an action. And then you have complex strategies, like downing, which begins with two defections, and later, at every step, you compute the probability of your opponent's cooperation. Now, which one do you think is the best strategy of all in the long run? In the late 1970s, a political scientist called Robert Axelrod decided to investigate this. He asked roughly 60 people, mathematicians, psychologists, political scientists, to submit computer programs that would compete against each other in a game of approximately 200 rounds. And the winner was a very, very simple strategy called tit for tat. The rule of tit for tat is the following. One, you cooperate on the first round. Two, on every subsequent round, you copy your opponent's previous move. I want to highlight something very important here. Tit for Tat won the tournament, but it never won against any opponent. It will either tie or finish slightly behind. Now, why did it win then? Well, it won because it scored better than all the other programs overall. It may be disappointing to see that the winning strategy seems so childish. However, it is very strong for several reasons. By analyzing all the top scoring strategies, Robert Axelrod realized that to be successful, a strategy needs to meet several conditions. 1. Not nasty. The strategy must not defect before its opponent does. 2. Not naive. The strategy needs to be able to retaliate in case the opponent defects. 3. Forgiving. The strategy must be able to come back to cooperation if the opponent cooperates. 4. Transparent. The strategy must clearly and quickly respond on cooperation or defection, so the opponent's strategy can adapt. 5. Non-jealous. The strategy must not aim at scoring more points than the opponent. And if you look at this, tit for tat exactly matches these principles. Now, can we apply this to real life? I will give you two fascinating examples, one coming from the animal world and one coming from European history. Biologists have used a prisoner's dilemma to explain a behavior that appears as a paradox to evolution. Altruistic behaviors in animal communities. This little fish here is called a guppy. Guppies are so small that they have a lot of predators, including bigger fish and birds. Therefore, they have to undertake a very dangerous task, predator inspection. Now, if a guppy refuses to risk its life and go for predator inspection, the other guppies will retaliate by not hanging around it. This is a form of tit for tat. Isn't it funny to see that this little fish intuitively adopted a behavior that defeated the most elaborated computer programs? The second example is taken from history. During the First World War, a strange phenomenon appeared. Soldiers started to develop cooperative, non-aggressive behaviors. This was particularly visible during the Christmas truce of 1914. Historians 
have called this phenomenon leave and let leave. Scholars of game theory, like Robert Axelrod, consider that this is a real-life example of tit-for-tat. Voila, I hope that this brief introduction on the concept of prisoner's dilemma will have sparked your curiosity. If you would like to see more videos like this one, you can hit the notification bell. Thank you very much for your attention, and see you next time.